today we're going to be introducing new software for thin film structure analysis. So this is the outline of today's presentation. I will start with introduction into angle-dependent XPS and angle-dependent HUXPS. Then I will discuss what are the approaches for processing angle-dependent data. And then we'll move on to the actual new product that we would like to introduce to you. Uh, I will show you the graphical user interface, applications, and features. And then we end up with uh, questions and answers. So we will start with looking at what makes XPS surface sensitive techniques. As we all know that X-rays penetrate quite deep into the sample, microns, and they generate photoelectrons throughout all the depths that they are interacting with materials. And photoelectrons move through the matter, and when they are colliding with surrounding matter, they lose energy. So only electrons from the very top surface uh, can escape without inelastic collisions. When these electrons escape, they have kinetic energy that we are measuring, and this is what contributes to our main photoelectron peak. However, some electrons scatter and end up in the background. They lose energy. As they lose energy, their kinetic energy decreases, and therefore their binding energy increases. So we will see this show up in our spectra as, if, as this increasing background intensity. As you see, there is a very fundamental uh, relationship between the intensity of the photoelectrons at specific depths as a function of the depths and lambda, which is an elastic mean free path, and sinus theta. And we will go through these particular uh, parameters in next slides. So the first parameter is an elastic mean free path. It is an average distance electron travels before it undergoes an elastic collision, losing energy completely. Universal curve is uh, something that probably all of us have seen before. It's a curve that relates an elastic mean free path with kinetic energy of the electrons. As you can see, there is a quite in uh, interesting relationship. It's not uh, straightforward, but there's a few uh, interesting uh, things to notice. You can see that for the same element, for example, for gold, we have several transitions and they have different inelastic mean free path. So of course, the larger inelastic mean free path will contribute to the large information depths. The electrons will uh, be originated from deeper layers. This curve is a simplification because it only plotted as a function of kinetic energy. But in reality, in elastic mean free path is also material dependent and density dependent. There have been quite a lot of work has done in calculating and measuring an elastic mean free path. Uh, over the years, uh, they have been suggested and published in the literature. Recently, Martin Sia has published simple equation that covers large range of energies for both XPS and HUXPS hard X-ray measurement range. And this relationship is shown here. So you can see that it is proportional to the energy, to the kinetic energy of electron, but it also depends on the atomic number of the material. And this relationship we'll see uh, throughout this presentation. So when you think of the total signal that is being created that we are detecting, it's 100% signal that comes as a photoelectron peak. This is, it, it will be under this curve. So 100% of the electrons detected are represented by this probability of ejection curve. So 63% of the signal comes from one lambda, from one inelastic mean free path, while 85 will come from, 86 will come from two times an elastic mean free path, and almost 100% will come from three times an elastic mean free path. Therefore, when we think of the sampling taps, for XPS, we are looking into sampling depths of three lambda. So XPS can detect a substrate that is located at the depths of approximately three times an elastic path, mean free path for that particular electron that will originate from the material. So as we've mentioned that an elastic mean free path will depend on the 
uh, kinetic energy. So there are several ways how we can change kinetic energy. And one way to change kinetic energy is to change the uh, X-ray source energy. So here's an example for information depths of, for aluminum K-alpha source and chromium K-alpha source. When we are increasing energy of primary source in three times, we are increasing sampling depths for silicon to P in silicon also approximately in, two, in three times. So the range of lambdas varies quite a lot, as you saw on the uh, universal curve. For aluminum K-alpha X-ray source, lambda can range from 0.5 to 4 nanometers, while for chromium, it will be three times higher than that, so between 1.5 nanometers to 12 nanometers. The other way to change sampling depths is the sinus theta to change the uh, takeoff angle. And this is the basis for angle-dependent or angle-resolved experiment. So in angle-dependent experiment, it's an non-destructive depth profiling method in which we are tilting the sample. And by when we are tilting the sample, we are changing effective steps of analysis. For normal takeoff angle of 90, sinus theta will be equal to 90, and therefore we will have largest depths of three lambdas. As we change theta to smaller takeoff angle, if the information depths will decrease. And this is an example of silicon to P um, angle dependent data. As you can see, when we are at the smaller takeoff angle, the proportion of the substrate of the silicon signal with respect to oxide layer, layer decreases. So accurate detailed structure depth profiling from angle dependent experiments is possible for up to two times lambda thicknesses. So then you can uh, refer to the values that I mentioned before for lambda range for aluminum X-ray source and chromium X-ray source and estimate what sort of thicknesses we can estimate using angle-dependent XPS and HUXPS. Something that uh, is important to um, show here is terminology. There has been a new guide on consistent terminology in XPS that came out this year, just recently. And uh, this is really important curve. So the angle of emission and takeoff angle make up for 90 degrees angle. So when we are talking about takeoff angle, we are talking about this 90 degrees angle between the surface and the photoelectron path towards the analyzer. While when we tilt in the sample, the shallow takeoff angle of 30 degrees will be um, as drawn here between the sample and the path, while the emission angle is between the sample and the and nor a normal uh, line that goes through the interacting with the sample surface. There are two different equations that therefore can be used to calculate, and both of them are completely equivalent and correct. But you need just remember which angle you are using when you're deriving this um, information depths when you're doing this calculation. So here's an example demonstrating how we can use um, angle-dependent XPS. So here is an example for sampled sampled monolayers. Sampled sampled monolayers have been studied by angle-dependent XPS quite a lot because they, this is the technique that really is sensitive to orientation of organic molecules on substrates. So when we are at the normal takeoff angle, we are looking at a fraction of the gold substrate and then we have a fraction of a self assembled monolayer that has a sulfur linker, linker um, towards the substrate. So the overall signal will be consist, consistent of different fraction of, of carbon, sulfur, and gold. When we tilt the sample, the electrons are travel the same distance, but effective distance becomes smaller. And here you see that smaller fraction of gold contribute, will contribute into the total signal. So by looking relative intensity between sulfur and gold, between carbon and gold, we can learn about orientation and we can calculate thickness of the self assembled monolayer. And this is the goal of uh, angle-dependent structural analysis uh, that we are presenting here today. So 
looking just at atomic composition as a function of takeoff angle, you can learn about gradients that ex may exist in your sample, orientation of molecules, uh, segregation phenomena, uh, but ma mainly the purpose is to calculate thickness of layers and to create depth profile of your structure without um, any destructive, uh, destructive methods such as ion sputtering. So there are two ways to process angle-dependent XPS data. The first one is relative depth plot, which is qualitative method, very fast and simple. And the second is a different types of quantitative optimization models. So let's look at relative depth profile first. So here's an example of atomic concentration profile for silicon nitride on top of hafnia. So we are plotting here just atomic concentration for all of the elements that have been detected as a function of takeoff angle. So you can see that oxygen is located in reached in depths, carbon signal is in reached closer to the surface. So you can learn about just orientation and uh, estimate what is present in your sample by looking at atomic uh, concentration plot. But relative depth profile is a, another way to look at the structure that is much more uh, visual. So relative depth index is a logarithm of peak areas. So instead of atomic concentration, we are now looking at the peak areas for the transition, the same transition that is at the surface, closer to the surface, let's say a 20 degree angle, was ratioed to that at the bulk, at the deeper takeoff angles. And when we plot this RDP index and for each of the transitions, that we have detected, the larger RDP indicates being closer to the surface. The smaller RDP indicates deeper. So for this example, we see that hafnium oxide is closer to the bottom, followed by silicon signal and nitrogen signal and carbon over there. So it's a very um, fast way to look at the sequence of the layers, uh, but there is no thickness information associated with that. In optimization model, what we are trying to model is the change in intensity of the photoelectrons as a function of our takeoff angle. When electrons are traveling throughout the depths, the photoelectron intensity will be attenuated. And that attenuation, the, the loss of intensity, is proportionate to the distance that our electrons go through. If you look at the sampling depths, if you'd like to relate to the actual depths from which this electron uh, originate from, this is, comes to this relationship, which is simple Beer-Lambert law. So there again, we see these parameters that we've mentioned before, in elastic mean free path and cosine theta, cosine alpha. So all of the models that I will be uh, showing the equation will be working as emission angle. And this Beer-Lambert law relates the drop in intensity to the depths from which electrons originated. So optimization models that we are discussing today, they analyze angular dependence of intensity with respect to the depths from which the signal originates. So this is what we're modeling. We are modeling concentration depth profile by measuring intensities of all of the transitions that are present as a function of uh, takeoff angle, which is converted into the alpha, and that is how we can derive concentration depth profile. There are multiple optimizations model that are available. The, uh, all of there's many publications that discuss them. The first one is two layer model, very simple overlayer model uh, that can be used. The straight line approximation of electron emission is what we're going to be, uh, what we are using in software introduced today. There's also a, a modification of straight line approximation with different scattering correction, including to account other transport phenomena that are happening while electrons are being emitted. And there are more uh, difficult methods, such as feeding using maximum entropy methods that you may have, have uh, heard. So let's look at this straight line approximation. So the goal of our model is to relate for electron intensity that we're measuring to concentration profile. 
this steps distribution function that we would like to measure, it's using a very simple exponential de decay of intensities. So when we, we are measuring over layer signal, and it has specific thickness associated with that. And if you, this is our concentration profile for this for, for, uh, for over layer signal. And you can see here in elastic mean free path for transition that come from over layer. And then we have the substrate signal and substrate signal will be attenuated. And this is the attenuation factor. It's proportional to the thickness of our over layer. And again, this is our um, concentration profile that we would like to model. And we have also an elastic mean free path of elements that comes of electrons that come from substrate. So when you combine these two in a very simple line equation, this is what equation looks like. So we are relating intensity of the transitions that come from the substrate to the intensity that are present in overlayer by this uh, factor from which we can calculate thickness over the overlayer. And fundamental parameters that go into effect is, of course, an elastic mean free path of transitions from which photoelectrons are originating. So now coming to, to the software. The software is Stratify. It's a new product that uses this straight line approximation to estimate structure of thin film stacks from spectral and angle dependent XPS data. So the software assumes that thin film structures ha have discrete layers. One of the features that we will show you today is that for multi-layered samples with unique chemistry, we can calculate thickness from spectral data measured at a single takeoff angle. Software also have a lot of features for automated data handling and output so that metrology application can be performed. So before we're going to look into different examples of application, I would like to show the interface. So here's how the software looks like when the data are loaded. So we're going to look individual of, of the, on these windows zoomed in. So first, we're loading our data. So our data are normalized intensities that come from either angle profile data or for spectroscopic data. In this case, this is an angle resolved profile we are plotting normalized intensity as a function of sinus theta for these transitions that have been included in our uh, data file. From this data, RDP is calculated. So RDP is a part of the interface. So it, this is what acts guiding model creation because it shows the sequence of layers. So for this particular sample, this is 76 Armstrom silicon oxide film on silicon substrate. We have carbon over layer followed by oxygen signals associ associated with part of the silicon in uh, oxide environment. And then we have silicon elemental at the uh, small, uh, deepest depths as uh, described by RDP. Layer definition table is based on the input and RDP and is completely editable by the user. So it's estimated by the software, but then the user can change the materials names they can move up and down, they can add or delete layers as they know their sample um, better than software does, of course. The, then the other part of the model is assignment of transition species to these layers that we are defining. So in this case, carbon ONS is only present in the carbon, carbon of a layer. Silicon oxide will have two transitions associated with that from oxygen and from silicon to P spectrum, and substrate will have just a transition associated with silicon elemental from silicon to P spectrum. So this is defines the model in terms of our data uh, definition. There are several options that we can uh, specify. One of them is which angles to use. So we can select whether to use all of the angles, subset of angles, or one angle. And then there are some calculations, options, and controls that I will introduce a little bit later when, once I start showing examples. And once you're ready, you can click Fit, and it will estimate sample structure. So ample, sam estimated sample structure showing a concentration as a function of depths for our carbon, oxygen, and silicon. And it also shows uncertainty. 
the width of the profile is uh, derived is actually represented by uncertainty and uncertainty can be calculated from the data itself so the higher the quality of the data the smaller uncertainty you will have in your concentration profiles estimated there are multiple options for export that we will uh, i will show you in more details a little bit later but you can export to powerpoint excel and ascii files and then we have attenuation lengths table this is the table that contains this important parameter such as uh, of our attenuation lengths. You can change this parameter and save it as your own database. You can edit a variety of, in a variety of different ways. So now let's look at applications. We're going to start with multi-layer thin thick thickness analysis and composition and adventitious carbon thickness calculations. So this is the first example. So here we are using aluminum X-ray source. So this is end-to-end-dependent -end XPS data for sample, which is alumina on top of hafnia on top of silica. And here we have a TEM that is, um, a, you know, what this, the thicknesses, the range of thicknesses are for these layers. So we load the data and we have normalized intensity as a function of sinus theta. From that, our DP is being calculated. And you can see that we have, as expected, silicon oxide and hafnia, then transition that come from alumina layer, and then carbon, and interestingly, oxygen that comes from silica signal is, uh, is that we, the way that it was curfitted also is, a, is on top. That may indicate that some of the oxygen in the same binding energy range actually present in the adventitious carbon layer. So, when we are modeling the structure and we're using all five takeoff angles for this sample, these are the output that we have. So we're calculating the carbon overlayer and then certainty associated with all of the thicknesses. So the other way to do that is what we call the option of restricted set. So here we are excluding oxygen from calculations completely. And when we're doing that, we can uh, look at only modeling the signal that comes from cations, from aluminum signal, hafnium signal, and silicon signal. Excluding oxygen is a challenge. It sometimes works uh, when you especially have a lot of overlap in your oxygen speciation that you need to assign to different oxides. And when you have also carbon that may have contribution from oxygen, uh, then it's a good test to see whether it will be affecting your output of the, from the results. So you can see that our results from calculations are very close to nominal and to those that are, uh, that are obtained from TEM. So coming back to our data obtained from five takeoff angles, this is how the structure that we will calculate it. Now I let's just use one takeoff angle. In this case, the data that we are modeling are were obtained using single takeoff angle, which is 45 degrees. This is a standard angle that does not require any tilting or special pattern. And you can see that we are able to derive very close concentrations to what, what has been calculated using five takeoff angle. So it's a very unique feature of Stratify to be able to accurately calculate thicknesses from a single takeoff angle. Now for the same sample, we have also an used chromium source. So now we're looking at uh, angle dependent Huxpis measurements. So very different transitions. So we see we are now can, uh, having access to high kinetic, uh, to high binding energy transitions. So for hafnium, we're using hafnium 3D, 5 half, silicon 1S and aluminum 1S. We have here, if we normalize silicon 1S, we see oxide part of the uh, signal and then metallic. So it's the 1S transitions are easier to work with because we don't need to curf use the doublets for curve feeding. And you also see that carbon is attenuated due to larger sampling depths. We are not as sensitive to carbon contamination, so carbon signal is much smaller. So all these three transitions have really similar kinetic energy. And that is important because at similar kinetic energies at the same takeoff angle, these electrons will have similar inel elastic mean free pass. So they will originate from the same depths. 
So if you look at attenuation lengths, it's three times larger than what we saw for, for, for aluminum source. So we are work, the attenuation length is really, um, instead of three for silicon, it's 7.4. So when we are modeling this data, using Huxpis is on top and using XPS is on the bottom. This is a model using all five using just single data at single takeoff angle, 45 degrees for both HACSPIS and XPS, we see that we have slightly different results. And actually, Hafnia layer is being um, the, uh, reproduced or modeled more adequately as predicted by TEM. So combination of both of these uh, analysis uh, has to be done in order to really understand, and this is something that we are working on into looking into how we can combine this data uh, to into the one model that will cal accurately, accurately calculate thicknesses from these structures. Here's another example. They're pushing the limits of sampling depths. So Huxpis is looking at 25 nanometer silicon oxide film. This is how this 45 degree takeoff angle spectrum looks like. So we have oxide peak and metallic peak for silicon 2P. So it has a, when we are using 5400 EV chromium source, the kinetic energy of this, of this electron is um, 5300. So it results in really high attenuation lengths. So the sampling depth is 9.6 times three times, times sinus 45 degrees. So that allows us to probe such thick films. And you can see that Stratify really models really accurately um, thickness of this 25 nanometer silica film. And it also shows us what is the thickness of carbon overlayer present. So now we challenge an example where we have alternating layers. So we have hafnia layer on top, followed by alumina, and then the same hafnia layer. So let's see how, whether Stratify will be able to calculate and, and adequately describe these thicknesses. So here's, we have data for all, for all five angles. So we nominal thickness and estimated from TEM is an order of two nanometers, and it does quite a good job. So we have two nanometers thickness, both layers are two nanometers for hafnia, and for alumina and silica, it's one nanometer thick. So it does really, Good job from out of from calculating thicknesses. So here is the uh, taking this uh, algorithm for a challenge and deciding to use just single takeoff angle, and you see that it's not working as as well. The distribution between the half near top and bottom layer is not correctly described. So if you then switch to two, just two angles we are coming back to, to the more correct uh, calc thickness calculations. So at this point, we recommend to have as many repeating angles, as many angles in your data sets as there are repeating layers. So in this case, we have two repeating layers and therefore two takeoff angle works really well. The next example that I would like to show is um, using a uh, all, uh, uh, angle dependent XPS for ultra thin layers. One of the features of phi spectrometer is having a narrow aperture, narrow mode aperture. So instead of having no angular acceptance from tw of 20 degrees, this is how we usually acquire data, there is a physical aperture that is introduced and that in, in decreases uh, our acceptance angles to five plus minus five degrees. And that improves layer definition for ultra thin layers. So we have analyzed graphene samples. So these are two-dimensional materials. We started with multi-layer graphene, and just by looking by carbon to silicon ratio as a function of, of sinus theta, we see enrichment of carbon at the surface and more silicon at the bottom, which is expected. And then we looked at two-layer graphene and y and layer graph, mono-layer graphene sample. But of course, we wanted to calculate the uh, thickness to, from, of, of these samples. The challenge for looking at the sample is that in addition to carbon that we are try to, trying to model from graphene, there is also an adventitious carbon layer that is present. So we needed to develop a model. So we have acquired data from thick graphene sheet. And we see that at the deeper, uh, at the 75 takeoff angle, we can model 
our graphene's representations really nicely, while at shallower angle, some contribution, uh, we need to add peaks that originate from adventitious layer. So this is the model that we can then apply to our monolayer, two-layer, or multi-layer uh, graphene samples. So we are including this model where everything is fixed, position, width, asymmetry. We are fixing this in place. This is our representation of a graphene. And then we're adding other peaks that representing uh, adventitious carbon. And that's the way that we are modeling these thicknesses calculations. So in the model that we derive for two-layer, we're using four degree for takeoff angles for this example, we are calculating carbon, thickness of adventitious carbon, and thickness of our graphene on top of silicon oxide. If we are using 20 degrees angle, which is the shallowest angle, the most sensitive one, and remember that all of these data were acquired using narrow aperture, so sensitivity to layer definition is really uh, high, we are getting really nice results. We are getting uh, as as good results as from multiple angles. So we can follow then the evolution of thicknesses from single layer to two layers to multi-layer. And these thicknesses are really close to reported in the literature that are done from optical methods and from calculations. So Stratify is able to predict thicknesses of monolayers. And for multi-layer film, we can derive and estimate that there's probably an average four layers in our sample. Using secondary X-ray, secondary electron images that are available in, in our XPS instruments, uh, we can actually study the homogeneity of these two-dimensional layers. So we can see that there are some uh, contrast differences, higher um, brightness areas and darker brightness areas. So when we are using small X-ray spot and uh, on, from from these selected areas, we see that some parts have more of adventitious carbon and some have less. And then we can model this single takeoff angle data from small 20 micron X-ray spot, and we can study uh, the thicknesses of both adventitious carbon layer and graphene distributions throughout a sample. So now coming um, towards this, introducing uh, features. So one of the, the feature that we would like to focus to really um, uh, focus on and, and show the benefits of is, is a, a calculations of thicknesses from single spectral data set. So there are multiple benefits of single spectrum analysis. Of course, first one is much faster time of acquisition. It's five or 10 times factor of improvement because you need to, to analyze only at the uh, 45 degrees angle uh, and that will save you a lot of time. The second is much higher flexibility. When you are using just single angle, you don't need to use smaller platen for angle dependent analysis. You can use larger platens that we have, and you can load more samples for higher throughput. When you are acquiring data from shallow take takeoff angles, the intensity really goes down, so you need to get good high quality signal to noise data. And then you need to process them really uh, well. So the uncertainty when is decreased when you have just single takeoff angle, that uncertainty that may come from the processing. In a combination with automated analysis tools that we are presenting uh, in this software, it provides excellent fast meteorological tool because you can create uh, recipes for your samples and then acquire data from single takeoff angle for, um, for really large number of uh, materials out of, in automated batch process. The next uh, feature is a database of attenuation lengths parameters. So database is a separate GUI that you can start from within the graphical user interface. You, there's already a, a quite extensive database of materials, but you can add your own. You can create for each of the material uh, transitions that uh, can, can come from the knowledge that from the literature measurements, and you can do that for the different sources that uh, you may use the, the data from. Um, if the value of attenuation lengths is not in the database for the material that you're using, there are two different ways that it can be calculated. For very accurate material dependence, you can provide density, atomic volume, and band gap, and then the formula from, from paper to 2012 
will be used. But if you don't have all of this um, band gap or density molecular weight, then software will look into kinetic energy and atomic number and use this simple equation and calculate an elastic mean free path. So you can be completely uh, using just calculation, simple method, or create your own database of ideation links. Materials recipes is something that really uh, opens up your capability of using ta single to takeoff angle uh, of acquisitions. Because the rest, the way that I showed you definition of layer tables and transition assignments, selection of takeoff angles, attenuation lengths, all of that can be saved as a recipe. And then when it's uh, applied, then all of the data that are loaded from the same type of structures that samples will be adequately treated and the data can be calculated. So one can imagine designing this model, this recipe from angle prof angular profile, and then acquiring a lot of data for high throughput metrological purposes from single takeoff angle data set. There are multiple export options. So we can import in PowerPoint all of the plots, RDP plot, estimated structure, etc. Excel can be used as a logging tool because with Excel you can have the types of uh, the, uh, structures calculations, uh, whether and all of the parameters that go into calculations, attenuation length, so you can automatically log your process of uh, uh, calculating thicknesses. And then it, you can export your profiles into ASCII files, so you can plot them in external program of your, dis of your preference. And the last one is high throughput batch processing. So we have added a lot of different uh, tools for automated analysis. You can specify a fo folder for automated processing, and then you can click this button and all of the files will be processed automatically, assuming that you have just created the output that you would like to all of this information logged in. Um, or you can use uh, one step, one data field at a, at a time. So you can load one file Maybe you would like to adjust some parameters, select some uh, angles, et cetera, but then it will go through all of the files in that folder until it tells you that I already processed all of the data in this folder. You can also enable watch mode. So basically you can work in the multi-pack on processing the data set and you can save the results and to see in, into the Excel file that is uh, used by Stratify, as soon as this file appears in that folder, it will be automatically loaded in Stratify and processed. And you can see how your processing affects your calculations. And in order to assist with that, we can have different types of options for logging the errors, for uh, updates, etc. So um, there's a really extensive uh, set of tools to help you with automation as much as possible. This is a summary slide of all of the Stratify features that were introduced during this webinar. You're welcome to contact us as we have 90 day trial available for you to test. And at this moment, I would like to thank you for joining us for this webinar and please use our online resources and watch out for new webinars.